thank you for your generous uh, donation of time, I suppose, if you want to call it that, for the project and, and everything else. Um, pleasure. I think when I first started talking to you, I was still starting my journey on how, how do I position this thing, that, the film, and the potential conversations with, with folk about um, being a vegetarian, being a vegan, not eating meat, and so on and so forth. I did a fairly big dive into um, Earthling Ed's YouTube channel, um, which was the recommendation from Joanne Lefson, the Picasso lady, I guess. Mm. Um, and she said, you know, um, listen to what he has to say because he explains um, why it's a good, really good idea not to eat meat, but also has conversations with people that are determined to eat meat. Yeah. Um, and, but, but kind of, he's quite rational and calm in the way he kind of, but I still felt that, and I'm not discrediting him, I'm really not trying to, but I still felt that the long haired Jesus look um, of a vegan talking to frankly, very right wing American males about why it just seemed too easy for, for him to beat that argument when he was getting such, you know, um, so I, I think that um, what, what I want to be able to do is um, argue the, the, the case or, or debate the case in a, in a way that I could quite comfortably do it in front of, a, of the owner of a farm that has been a cattle farm for a livestock farm for three generations and have a decent conversation about um, you know what what's to be done about about it because I think something I mean I said to Joanne yesterday I, I do feel as if there's going to be a point in time where people just won't eat meat anymore because it doesn't make any sense to because mm -hmm. plant-based stuff is just as nice nice and as tight as tasty or as nice yeah. and tasty. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and um you know there's there's no environmental impact i think although when you hear the arguments she's like yeah but um, the, the, there's an impact on ongoing Le less environmental impact yeah. I think is what you need uh, to say and, yeah. and so on and so forth so I really want to I really want to be sat in front of the people that make the strongest case to eat meat to help folk that are on the fence to go because I think if you're on the fence the last thing you want to hear is um, a guy saying oh well the, the answer to you know the the farmers um, issue over lack of, of funds is wildly which is what he said recently uh, in an interview. And I just thought, well, is it, would he be laughed out of the, the kitchen of a farm if he came, that was his solution to, to it? Um, and I, I, I kind of feel, even though I'm on the surface level of all this, that he, that, that he would. And, and, mm -hmm. I, and I think that humans, you can rationalize with all humans, but the last thing you do is you poke them with a stick and antagonize them because you won't get anywhere. If, if I, that's what you do i completely agree i think it's it's you know and i've been leading the vegetarian society now for eight months mm -hmm. there are thereabouts and what i've been at pains to stress all the way through that is you know we are not here to jab people in the forehead and tell them they're bad for eating meat because um, it doesn't win any arguments mm -hmm. it doesn't you know no one wants to be told they're a bad person and you know, everybody holds that degree of cognitive distance, don't they? You know, I, there's very few people in this world who don't understand that meat comes from an animal. Mm -hmm. And most people instinctively understand that the cows you see in the field do go off for slaughter at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, you know, don't get me wrong, there are some people who you talk to who say that I watched, you know, um, if abattoirs had glass walls, I watched cow spirits, I watched these films, and I went vegan overnight and I'm still vegan. Um, there are a lot more people who will take a lot more persuasion and hand-holding and mm. exploration if we want to call it that you know to get them there and it needs to I always say to people you know it needs to feel exciting it needs to feel like it's an adventure not like I've put a hair shirt on and sudden life's all doom and gloom and I need to live in a teepee and go back to the stone age which is often what you get when you talk about renewable energy or some or you mm. know the, the rest of the environmental movement so I do think this is 
you know, you're not going to solve this problem overnight. And I absolutely agree. I, I you know, I, I live for the day when we're not eating animals anymore. Mm. Uh, you know, and in many ways, we're not farming or exploiting animals anymore. Mm. I think we are on the cusp of a change. You know, we we were <laughs> Homo sapiens have been around for about two hundred thousand years, and boy, we've made a right mess in that time, haven't we? We wiped out all the megafauna on on most continents. Um, you know, the climate is we're in the middle of a climate self declared climate emergency. Mm. Um, and we were hunter gatherers for a long time. We've been farmers for a long time. I suspect we're on the on the cusp of a new food revolution. But you know, you you are fighting against thousands and thousands of years of ingrained culture when it comes to food and meat. And and simply shouting, "Hey, world, go vegetarian or vegan," is is not you know. If it was as simple as that, we'd all be doing it now. So, you know, this is a. This is for the longer term. You've really got to be thinking about what the world looks like in 2030, 2040, 2050. Yeah. And then thinking about the strategies for how you bring people along with you on that journey, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think, I suppose, the people that get hit the hardest mm -hmm. on that transition are the ones that kind of <clears throat> I'd like to explore. Um, because I, I was on the edge of my seat when um, Earthling Ed was you know, on one side of the screen and then there was the chairman of the NFU on the other. <laughs> um, oh, I think it was the Scottish NFU. Um, and uh, he said, well, what, what, what will all the farmers do if they can't, you know, farm livestock anymore? And I was, I was waiting for that answer. Um, and I, I mean, wildling, I mean, is that a, a legitimate way of, of helping farmers transition or should- You say rewilding is what you mean. Rewilding, what did I say? Wildling. Wildling. Is that like a... I think it's a children's story, but maybe I don't know. <laughs> well, there you go. There's the, <laughs> that's where the wild there, things live, isn't it? That's research. over that. Yeah. Um, rewilding. rewilding. Yeah, no. It's definitely, there is an opportunity to rewild, because as much as we talk about being in the middle of a climate crisis, we're also in the middle of a biodiversity crisis. Um, there are some wonderful charts based on academic research that shows that I, I can't remember the exact, but it might be. But if you if you were to adopt a vegetarian diet, you would reduce the amount of land in formal agriculture by about half. And if you adopt a vegan stroke plant based diet, you reduce it by three quarters. I think you go from I can't remember the exact, but something like four billion hectares to one billion hectares in cultivation. And of course, what that means is you think, well, what do we do with the rest of that land that's no longer needs to be farmed in a, in a you know, a, let's face it, in a fairly aggressive monoculture type way, you know, single crops, uh, even if it's grassland. Um, suddenly you think, wow, actually, we could just let that rewild, you know, mm -hmm. and, and there will be conservation organisations that say we well, can't just let it rewild because it will just go to tatty scrub. Mm -hmm. um, and you get what's called the climax community, which is usually woodland, because, of course, you know, Five six thousand years ago, most of the UK was covered in thick, dense forest. It's you know we we started cutting it down and clearing. It. <clears throat> but there are some fantastic heathlands, grasslands, which are actually kept in a managed state between that transition. Well, that's the fun of it. You could have all those conversations mm. around. Well, you know, if we want to improve the biodiversity upon which we all depend, mm. people talk about pollinators and bees. Mm. You know, but they are one part of that complex web of biodiversity which we we interfere with at our peril, and we have been doing for many yeah. many years. Um, so I think what people what's really important for people to realise is that actually the the, the the more we move to an increasingly vegetarian and or plant based diet, not only do we reduce our own personal carbon footprints, and of course the food system in the round is thought to be responsible for somewhere around a third of all global carbon emissions. Not only do we have a positive impact on that, but we also have a positive impact on land and its use and we can improve our biodiversity. And, you know, who doesn't want a rich, flourishing, green, biodiverse world? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, without the, the, the cruelty that we, we apply to animals. And I think you're right, when it comes to Earth and Ed, I mean, look, I've got his book, I've, you know, This Is Vegan Propaganda, his latest book, I'm, I'm just mm. partway through reading it. You know, his arguments are good. He makes really yeah. good arguments. But I'm sort of with you in a way that actually, if I can use an example um, uh, up near where I live is in the UK, it's near the uh, the test site for fracking, right. which has obviously been in, in the news recently, particularly yeah. because they're looking, you know, should we restart it in the in the face of the, you know, the war in Ukraine and the gas crisis? 
Um, when it was live and they were testing it, there were huge protests. But my sort of criticism was, it's fantastic that people give up their time to protest, but they look like eco-protesters. Mm. There's lots of multicolored clothes, there's lots of dreadlocks, there's lots of... So I think people walking past go, well, that's what protesters look like, that's not me. Yeah. And the trick, no, and that's not to demean that group at all, What the, their activism is incredibly powerful, mm. and these, these are passionate people, and we need those people in, yeah, the, yeah. in the fight. But you also, you know, you need people who look a bit like me, mm. boring and ordinary, you know? Um, because uh, that's what most people look like, you know? Yes, most people, yes. they don't look like, um, you, you know, you're on Love Island and you don't mm. look like an eco you just look ordinary and normal. Mm. And you need to, I mean, there's a dreadful word, but it's true, you need to mainstream this. You need mm. to make plant-based foods, vegetarian, vegan foods, whatever you want to call it, you need to make it the norm for people. Yeah. Um, and you do that by more and more people who look <laughs> like mm. each other adopting it and thinking it's normal i i know i i completely agree i i think uh, but i think that that's it's kind of like a quiet activism and and brand visual thing i think we are all there um it's just taking that extra step to actually getting to you know getting onto the streets and actually doing some form of activism i think is but i think that'll come i think if it has well, to, it, well, it does um, come you know i've been down in london you know i was on the greta thunberg march in Bristol just before lockdown actually you know, there was thousands of young people there marching for climate mm. being at protests in London um, for you know animal rights and again lots and lots of young people and activists um, the trick will be to take that and to and to, to take that groundswell of on the ground activist support but then to you know how do you actually stand for instance in front of a group of politicians in Westminster mm and convince a lot of people in suits who mm. need people to vote for them that actually um, developing policies which are pro-vegetarian, pro-vegan, and maybe not pro-meat Me. are actually not just good for the future, mm. but potentially vote winners as well. The politicians that I've, I've met a few in my time, I think they've mostly been conservative for whatever reason. Um, but they, more. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but they, they tend to re represent, you know, quite rural constituencies. Um, and I've lived and worked with, I mean, I'm from, you know, the sticks myself. I know the people that would have the objections. And I think they'd make some pretty, pretty strong arguments, but I want to be able to give better ones back, or at least ones that make them go, oh, well, I didn't, I didn't realise that, or actually I've never really thought about it that way. And that's a tough gig to try and achieve because um, they tend to be quite intelligent people as well that, you know, oh, absolutely. Uh, own Switch their own, own farms or own their own land and um, or run businesses that would be affected if, if et cetera, et cetera. So I really want to be able to um, speak to them at their, at their kind of level, really. I, I, I'd agree. And I think if I can, if I can use another um, sort of example, when the Occupy movement was huge, you know, and you had people outside St. Paul's Cathedral, you had people on Wall Street in the States, um, and the, 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 that huge encampment was set up outside St. Paul's, you had um, the Reverend of St. Paul's, uh, you know, who was actively supporting them, and I think stepped down in the end because, you know, he felt his position was untenable. Mm -hmm. um, but when the protesters were interviewed and they were saying, well, okay, so you don't like capitalism, we get that, but what's the alternative? Very, very few of them could mm. construct a 30 yeah. second argument to say, well, the alternative is. Yeah. Um, they could critique what was wrong with the current system, but they couldn't give a solution that yeah. would go, oh yeah, I get it, right, that's what we need to do. Yeah. And that is a huge problem, as you say, because if you're gonna stand in front of somebody who is a you know a, a multi generation farmer who's been on the land for a long time who who is thinking that your job is to try and put them out of business or throw them off the land? Of course you're going to get pushback. And you know I'm somebody I'm from an ordinary working class background. You know my dad was in the mining industry in the 80s. Um, he was on strike for 12 months with the miners, um, and then the two pits were one pit first closed. He moved to another pit that closed, and you know a lot of northern towns and midland towns were thrown on the scrappy yeah and i think 
meat farmers will be looking going well is that what you want to do to us you just mm. want to close us down and chuck us out um and of course not you know i wouldn't want anyone to go through what people in the mining industry had to go through in the 80s with such a you know a, a, the whole scale closure of pits and whole towns thrown into turmoil mass unemployment what you need a lot of people talk about a just transition and and the reality is that is what we need you need to work with people who are currently in industry to, to set that sort of no actually what we're we're not looking to kick you off your land necessarily we're looking to to give you a different way of looking at mm. how we use that land and how we farm it and you know george mombio who's you know a lot of times george mombio he's the, he's the you know great writer great environmental activist has just written a book i think it's called regenesis which is all about that you know how do you transition away from our current systems towards rewilding. He, I don't know if you, he wrote a book called Feral, which is very good, which is all about. It's very interesting because I, I remember I'd read it and then we were up in Northumbria, uh, in the Northern Pennines. And I took a, a, a photograph of landscape that looks very bucolic. You know, there was um, uh, managed uh, pasture land at the bottom with sheep. There was upland grouse moor, and then there was a conifer block plantation. And you take a photo, it looks very nice. But actually what you've got is three complete monocultures You've got grass and crap <laughs> at the bottom. Right. You've got um, managed uh, heather, which is regularly burned at the top and not much else. And then you've got a conifer block plantation, which is completely unnatural as well. So it looks lovely, mm. but it's, it's a, pretty much like a dead landscape, right. really. Mm-hmm. You know, right. Whereas really, if you had an extremely biodiverse landscape, you'd have a huge, huge richness, richness there, which you could do if you took the stock off the landscape mm. and allowed it to... Um, do what it needs to do albeit with a little bit of human management but of course you know there is then the questions of well who pays for that you know at the moment i'm running a business and i'm selling my stock and i'm getting i'm getting money for it i think what most people forget is that you know farming is one of the more heavily subsidized industries you and i pay for it as taxpayers you know we are all the single farm payments and the grant schemes that farmers get are all funded through taxpayers money so it is already a subsidized industry to a certain extent so i think what we need to do is to look at the the economics of farming and start to go well okay to your point scott rob just going hey you know meat is murder we want to you know say actually no okay we recognize you're all human beings and you need to live and eat like the rest of us here's how we think you can you know manage the land that you're on actually for public benefit Mm -hmm. you know we will all all when when the croat came in and you know land was opened up you know moorlands the right to roam um that was fantastic but it's only really in the in the slightly unmanaged upland areas you know imagine if all those grassland areas that are currently fenced off do not trespass stay on the footpath were opened up and you know we as citizens could could roam that land safely you know without destroying it but you know not not worried about worrying the sheep <laughs> Um, but you'd have this fantastic, rich, biodiverse landscape. You know, the people who manage the land would be being recompensed for it. Um, uh, you know, but you, you're absolutely right. You have to, what, what we as activists have to do is to find that rational argument so that when you, Scott, are sat like Earthling Ed opposite that farmer, mm. you can, you can um, empathise with their position, first of all, you know, walk a mile in their shoes type thing, mm. but then start to put what sounds like a very credible alternative so that you don't sound like you're, you know, slightly out there. With no, you have to have respect for uh, the fact that they have families and run businesses and always have, and it's been fine for a long time. Um, and it is difficult to change, you know, I mean, that was the, I mean, I'm no expert, but certainly what you're alluding to back in the 80s was the massive problem was they just shut everything down and didn't have any any, any plan. And, and well, it was politically so driven, just... wasn't it, to a certain extent? My, my view would be it was politically driven. And, you know, it was it was about, you know, getting rid of union power hmm. to much, much yeah. extent. And unfortunately, miners and their industry were just collateral damage and all of that. And, you know, I would never want anyone to go through that again. And I think, you know, farmers are human beings. So they've got families. They hold a very different view because they have you know they've grown up and developed in a world of meat farming you know why would they be vegan activists yeah yeah (laughs) or vegetarian activists um and and i think okay it doesn't feel quite as 
self-empowering is if you go along protesting and you know and shouting and holding placards and yelling at people but i actually and i think that has a that has a place don't get me wrong i think that definitely has a place but i think the the quiet activism and the quiet negotiation you know again are you to use a parallel which might feel a bit odd but if you look at northern ireland mm. Peace was achieved in Northern Ireland actually mm. from a lot of very quiet backdoor negotiations mm. that went on over many years while people were killing each other. Mm. Um, and it was actually politicians that sort of, you know, Mo Mel in particular, that sort of resolved that in the end. And I think you've got a similar thing here. It will be that slow process of engagement and talking and treating people like fellow human beings mm. But at the same time, to your point, having some very credible solutions, not just shouting about the problems without having a very clear idea of what the solutions are. Mm. Um, and they don't necessarily disempower one person or another is going to be critical to this whole um, situation. I think that people are, with, with the, I've definitely seen over the last, certainly six, six to 12 months, the, the um, the amount of choice that you have in supermarkets now is so radically different to how it used to be. Um, and I, I think there will be, well, there will be, and there is a, a transition that people are making anyway. And it's going, you know what, I'll buy, you know, like Richmond sausages, the, ve the, the veggie ones versus the, they look and taste exactly the same. So the more that happens, the more people will just naturally transition. That's going to, have an effect on the farmers anyway, because business is just going to be less boomy than it used to be, if if at all. Um, yeah, that so is a very good point. And I, I, you know, I gave a talk actually just yesterday to a, a, a local authority, and it was um, because it we are in the middle of this, this. This interview is happening in the middle of National Vegetarian Week, which yeah. is our you know our annual headline campaign. And I was it was because of that that they'd asked me to come and talk to them and their employees. And one of the points I was making was change will come not just because people like you and I are going out trying to talk and spread the word, but just because the landscape around people evolves and changes as well. Mm. There's some wonderful research that shows um, it looks at menu design and it suggests that if around 70% of a menu is vegetarian and vegan, people will tend to pick the vegetarian and vegan right. options rather than try to go down and find the meat options. Really? And I think, you know, I live for the day. I live for the day when there's no meat in this supermarket at all. But I, I, in an interim, as a milestone, I'd live for the day when the plant-based section of the supermarket is the meat-based section. Yeah. yeah. So if you are still insist on eating meat, there is a small section in the store here which has some of your meat. The rest of it's all veggie, vegan, plant-based. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the choice, look, you know, I, I became vegetarian in the 80s and, and really, um, you know, sausages and burgers were available but you had to get them from a health food shop there was no internet obviously um there was something wonderful called tbp which was a sort of soya powder mince that you put boiling water on and stirred up through herbs and spices out and hope it tasted or something um you know that, that was you had your beans and your again tofu from a health food shop but you know i fast forward now yeah i think my Goodness, you know, he, and to be honest, these plant-based sections are really only in the last few years in supermarkets. Yeah, yeah, it is. Really it's very up. recent. And now you've got there's almost two or three. You've got one with your, you know, your steaks and your sausages and your burgers. You've got another section with your classic tofu or corn mm. or these products. Um, and then you've got your plant-based milks section yeah. as well, yeah, and milk-based uh, plant-based yogurts. And yeah. um, and I think you're right. You're right. You, I mean, it's a really good point you make. The fact that. Um, as much as my job is to encourage people to become vegetarian or vegan or to reduce their meat and get on that journey, actually just changing the way we produce our food around mm. people mm. and giving them foods that look, taste, the similar to what they eat, have a texture that's similar mm. to what they eat, is going to be one huge part in changing this whole agenda. So rather than people sort of um, taking a moral decision to be vegetarian or vegan, they will just almost de facto start to eat more plant-based foods. And did you did you uh, say somewhere that the the way to be able to help that transition as well is by making meat slightly more expensive or plant-based foods slightly cheaper? So it was a financial, like your your, your five p bag kind of. Yeah, I I wrote a a, a, a think piece so. Um, 
and there's a there's a, a an organization called the institute of accounting technicians um which is not as dull as it sounds but you know <laughs> these are very 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 good people and every year they have an article that, that, that encourages different writers to say how might we use the tax system to to create you know a socially more just world if i can put it like that and and you know clearly they asked me they asked me to write a piece on meat tax and that's a classic point of like what we've been talking about the second you say i know let's tax me everyone goes no <laughs> you know or, well not everyone but the people you need on side go yeah. no how dare you you know it, a it's a tax and b i like meat so that's yeah. you know straight away you know buzz i'm out um, and what I was saying was actually, you know, you need to frame it more as a carbon tax, which is actually a lot more people mm. going, yeah, yeah, tax on carbon, that, you know, that, that is a big crisis, isn't it? And of course, if you talk about carbon tax, you can't help but tax meat as a result, because mm. the carbon emissions per kilogram of meat, particularly beef, are huge. Um, and, and hence, if you make, it's like, you know, progressive taxation is all about taxing out the bads and you know, reducing tax on the goods. And that's how you, you know, how you encourage people to spend their money in good ways. Um, but the, what people automatically say is, and I had this, a, a charity I used to work with, we looked a lot at, you know, um, packaging and, and the costs mm -hmm. of packaging. Um, I used to say, oh, if you, if you impose costs on people to try and get them to reduce packaging, you know, It'll cost jobs and you'll hit the poorest members in society the hardest. And that's always the two arguments the business comes yeah, back with. Yeah. It's going to, you'll lose jobs and you'll hit the poorest in society the hardest. And yeah, of course, if you make, I mean, you look at the discussions this week, the price of chicken is going through the roof. You know, what will we do with school meals? And so, well, the, swap the chicken out for chickpeas. And, <laughs> and there you go. But I, the article I wrote was, yeah, you've got to focus on increasing the price of meat, but you've got to focus on, on reducing the price of the alternative mm -hmm. things that you want people to eat. Because otherwise you'll say, well, it's going to cost jobs in the industry and you're going to hit the poorest members in society harder. So, well, no, you're not. Because actually what we're going to do is encourage people to eat really healthy foods, which yeah. are just as good, just as tasty. Uh, and we'll use the money from the tax up here to recycle back into reducing the costs of these items down here. So you don't hit the poorest members of society mm. the hardest. And actually, you incentivize those people in the industry who are producing those other foods that you want. Mm. You know, whether that's people importing chickpeas or whether that's people who are making Richmond sausages, which are very good, I have mm. to say, by the yeah, way. Yeah, really good. Um, and so you use the, the you know, you, fiscal drivers. If you use the tax system in a way that, yeah, let's increase the price of meat and let's bring down the cost of fruit, vegetables, beans, pulses, Richmond sausages, whatever it might be. Um, you know, and people will, well, classic economic theory suggests that people will move towards it. There is also a, a thing called heuristics where people take shortcuts in their head as well. Right. Okay, well, I still love my meat. So there's a guy selling it out his car boot behind the pub. Let's go and get it there. <laughs> like people will joke. find shortcuts. But by and large, you know, it, it's like anything, isn't it? you know, make things more expensive and mm. make alternatives cheaper. Mm. People, particularly the cost of living crisis at the moment, people will go for the cheaper options. Well, but you have to put the wrap around around that and say why it's good as well, and why it's, you know, and make it attractive rather than, you know, oh dear, am I just going to be eating a diet of mung beans and herbal tea for the rest of my life? I mean, I've, I've not eaten meat now for the last six months, and I would, I really, I really dug my burgers and my, my steaks and that kind of stuff. Um, and after, after six months, I don't miss it anymore. I feel healthier. Um, and I, I find that what I eat is more interesting because it's, it's so easy to go for a, a formula that you know makes you happy. Um, yeah. If you're at Nando's or wherever. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good old Nando's, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, one of the, in the interesting counter arguments to eating a plant-based diet that I've had of late has been um, and then I'm not saying I used to eat, partic eat particularly healthily before, but that, and I, I, I don't know whether I alluded to this before, but, but just how healthy mass produced vegetarian vegan food is like the, the Richmond sausages, let's say, um, are they just as bad for you? Because then my argument to, to meat it is you should try them because they taste just as disgusting as the real things. And I, but I like them, but we know what we mean by that. But are 
Richmond, and I'm, I'm not expecting you to know the answer, it's just kind of like a, out there, are they as unhealthy as eating um, Richmond real meat sausages? And do we have to be cautious about just diving into, you know, your corn nuggets and your, your what the cluck chicken and all that kind of stuff? I mean, is there, or is it all just good for you? No, the, the, the answer is yes. Of course, you have to be cautious. I think if you there is a, there is a there is a difference between a sort of whole foods, mm. nutrient dense veggie or vegan diet and the diet where you use a lot of the meat substitutes that are there at the moment. And I think you you know I, my argument would be yeah, people say they're unhealthy that they they're categorised as ultra processed food. Um, just because they're processed doesn't mean it's instinctively unhealthy. You know, mm. most foods have some degree of processing unless it's raw fruit mm. and vegetables. And there is a scale, and at the top of the scale is ultra processed, where some of these foods sit. Um, some of them do have higher levels of salt than perhaps you know mm. we would like. But there is again, there is work. It's a program called Action on Salt, and a number of these manufacturers are very conscious of getting the salt layer levels down in these right. foods. There's also a very clear understanding within a number of these businesses, and I've heard it described many times before, that nobody wants to turn the packaging over and see an ingredients list that looks like a chemistry set. Mm -hmm. no. And so mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. there's a lot of work going on in these meat subs to say, can we reduce the number of ingredients? Can we make them feel more natural? Or, or, or actually, can we just make them natural and can we reduce the levels of salt? But can we retain that taste and that texture mm -hmm. and that look as if it looks like a sausage or a burger or chicken mm -hmm. pieces? And... Um, do you know what? I think we'll get there, definitely. Mm. But at the moment, I would say it's they're like any food. Have a look at, you know, most foods now are traffic lighted. Have a look at the fat, salt and sugar and take a view. And, yeah, yeah. and you know, eat them in the same way that you would eat sausages and bacon yeah. and burgers. I eat no, not three yeah. times a day, not for breakfast, yeah. lunch and dinner. You know, it, yeah. anyone eating that is, is not going to be healthy. Mm. Um, because you know, when the World Health Organization linked red meats to cancer, it's you know, it's because we overeat these things in Western mm. society. So, um, but for me, I would say, um, the 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 they're no better or worse than the the meat they're trying to swap out, except for the fact that you're not killing an animal and your carbon footprint is also a lot yeah. lower, particularly when it comes to yeah. beef. So eat them as part of a balanced diet, you know, have them a couple of times a week, but have a, a chickpea stew or a lentil curry alongside it. And that comes back to your point about richness of the diet. You suddenly, and again, I said this on the, on the, the, the call I had yesterday with the local authority saying, you know, actually um, use a trip to the supermarket as a voyage of, of discovery and exploration. Mm. Spend, stay in the fruit and vegetable aisle and spend more time looking around. Don't just go for broccoli, Mm. sweet corn and whatever else you go have a look and go actually do you know what kohlrabi what do i do with that you know just mm. have a little celeriac what, what yeah, is that yeah. what do i do with it have a look we'll go and experiment go to the the beans and pulses section and don't just pick up a can of baked beans mm. look at all the different beans both tinned and dried that they're thinking actually yeah, yeah. You know what? there's a world of beans out there. we should all be eating more beans you know? yeah they're actually very very good for you from a digestive point of view um they have other effects as well um <laughs> but then you know look at um the meat substitutes as well and build those in but don't mm. make them absolutely central to everything you do because i suspect at the moment yeah they're, they're probably if you eat them three times a day it's not going to be healthy but if you eat a, a balanced diet where you have whole foods alongside some of these other foods as a treat just like just like you eat the so meat anyway, at the moment yeah you're going to be fine but you but you will but you won't have a stake in the whole animal agriculture industry which i think is most people are too accepting of you know i think we do and people get very upset if you use you know if you compare it to things like the slave trade and the people who fought back against the slave trade because that's human beings how can you compare animals to human beings well i'm going to compare animals to human beings you know mm. they are emotional sentient creatures in fact you know parliament only just in april passed a bill recognizing animals with a vertebrate including some that don't like lobsters and crabs yeah. as sentient, sentient yeah. now that has yet to track through into any policy but we'll see so if they're sentient and they feel pain mm. and emotion then you know i think I'd much rather be buying some Richmond sausages than buying the alternative and, and, and take myself outside that whole industry. Mm. No, I totally agree.
I totally agree. And I think I think that in my experience so far, it's been what about the farmers and their business? The food, yeah, is it as good as you say it is? Um, there's a fair amount of passion to debate it back without much research as well, but it's just the idea of going, well, you're telling me or suggesting I should do something I've always done. So, but the other, the other most common one that I've experienced, and, I, and I, I've not really been able to, Joe uh, Kendall, a friend of mine, kind of said, well, you know, they're just being bred to be killed. So, duh. Um, but the argument of, well, what happens to all, you know, you, you go for a, a walk on a Sunday past a load of fields and it's full of sheep, cows um, and whatnot. And if we go the direction that we think we're going to go, what happens to all of those animals? And how do you, they're kind of like you, they, they turn the table of the moralistic argument and go, well, you, yeah, but you're going to make, you know, one person said, well, they, they would go instinctive, extinctive if you did that. Um, I mean, you must have heard that argument. I've heard that argument many times. Well, I mean, it's, what it's what a, do you say? Because my argument's always a bit rubbish. <laughs> well, um, like the reality is, you know, you're not you're not going to suddenly stop and go out to fields and shoot them all. You know, no. and say, right, that's it. We've washed our hands of animal agriculture. This is we talked about a transition before, and this is a managed transition. I mean, you talked yourself around if people stop buying as much of these things, then over time, less and less will be bred. You mm -hmm. know, you'll probably find that people go for the more exotic breeds and start selling meat as a luxury item. You know, this is a this is Herdwick lamb and, you know, rather than it just being lamb lamb. Mm -hmm. um, so you, I think you will get a managed decline. Herds will naturally come down over time. Um, people used to say, but yeah, but you know, that these poor animals won't have a life. Well, you know, it's not much of a life, isn't it? Being, you know, particularly when it's going to be, if you think about the average cow, you know, the average cow can live to an age of 25. Most of them are slaughtered at five. Well, in human terms, that's a sort of late teenager, mm -hmm. you know? So, and it's a pretty brutal ending, whether we like it or not, whether it's been, you know, grass fed on wonderful pasture, it's still being bundled into a van and slaughtered quite horribly. Mm -hmm. If you describe the process of slaughter in human terms, people would be aghast if it was yeah. a human being, but we call it humane. So I think, um, and let's forget, not forget that these animals, you know, the way they look now is not the way they looked hundreds of years ago. You know, they've been bred from wild versions of animals. You know, there is the wild version of the sheep, there's the wild version of the cow, the auric. Um, and so, you know, let's go back to the to the way they were. Let's let's reduce demand over time. Herds will come down. At some point, some farmers will go, do you know what? I'm probably going to wrap it up and mm. we'll stop. And yes, those last few animals may well end up going to the abattoir before the farm closes, but at least they won't be breeding and breeding more animals mm. into what is fed. Let's face it, it's a life of slavery. They sit within walled compounds. Sometimes they don't even see any daylight. And at the end of the day, they're slaughtered well before their natural time. Mm. So it's not that you would just have this sudden stop and you turn around and go, but we've got 7 billion animals. What do we do with them? Yeah. It comes down over time and then um, you know, the native species from which they were originally bred live a happy life in the wild just as they would have done ordinarily. And, and I suppose and the, if we're talking about rewilding, um, exactly. that's, that's where they'd be. Yeah, that you, you'd rewild, it's funny to me, you'd rewild and, um, you know, you'd look at the the territories and the climates in which they would naturally, you know, live and that's where they would they would be. And you'd look over here and you'd think, well, let's let it rewild and you know there are already people talking about introducing you know beavers have been reintroduced in this country there's i think there's managed the state where they've reintroduced wolves now that's a controversial one mm. george bombio goes further and, and i think he's slightly tongue-in-cheek but talks about you know reintroducing lions in this country which we probably had the pre-ice age going back a bit but yeah i think we you know we probably draw a line somewhere just never think about that one <laughs> yeah 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 exactly it would make a walk in the lake district it would give it a frisson of excitement that perhaps it doesn't quite have at the moment um if you were attacked by a mountain lion but um but the reality is i think what what people like you and i and others need to do is to to to, to paint a vision of what this future world mm. looks like it's yeah, an exciting yeah. place it's a rich biodiverse world when you go out walking you'll be surrounded by fantastic wildlife um it's a world where farmers are treated fairly. They're not treated as the enemy, they're treated as human beings who happen to work in an industry which have probably served its time because mm. technology and other foods are meaning we can create food. You can live a fantastic, I always say to people, 
The only reason really that animals are slaughtered now, particularly in Western countries, is because we like the way they taste. Mm. It's not because we need them for food or health or anything else. And that's not a good enough reason in my eyes to slaughter an animal and take its life before it's time because it tastes good. Mm. Um, and so I do think we're on the cusp of that change. Yeah, but, you know, too. paint the vision of what that future world looks like and then have, to your point, have that plan. So when somebody says, yeah, but how do we get there? Mm a bit like my Occupy processes thing before, rather than going, oh, 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 yeah, but the problems, the system's broke. Yeah, you've answered that question. I'm asking you how you're going to solve it. Mm. Have that very clear plan about how you march towards it. And also be clear, it's not happening tomorrow. Mm. As much as I'd love it to, it's not happening tomorrow. You're probably yeah. talking 2050 and beyond yeah. before this I transition happens. Good. And that's before you start thinking about the global south and mm. the southern hemisphere, and then you really are into issues of you know global justice, just because... I can nip down around the corner to Tesco or Asda and buy some Richmond sausages. Doesn't mean that somebody in a, in a, a less developed country can. Mm. Um, and you know, that's that. So we, this is, this is a longer term transition, but um, having said that this decade is when we need to move really quickly. If you think about it from a climate perspective, everybody says, you know, we're running out of time, we're running out of time. It's a climate emergency. It's in danger of becoming a tired cliche. Hey, it's a climate emergency. But we're not treating it as if your own house is on fire. If your own house was on fire, you'd, you'd be running around like a yeah, maniac with buckets of water on the phone to the fire brigade. People say climate emergency and then go about their day-to-day -day business. So as much as I said this is a long-term transition, the other side of that is trying to encourage as many people as possible to say, look, if you want to be a climate activist, not everyone can afford an electric vehicle. Not everybody can install a ground source heat pump. But everyone can change their diet in the next mm. five minutes. You can I mean, change it tonight. When you go to the fridge, you can do. change it. You know, yeah. you can make a decision now. Um, and actually, given that we're running out of time when it comes to climate, that's probably the quickest and best thing you could do. I, I think that the, the trick is it's to find that balance because you've got to you've got to be a realist. You've got to be you've got to be of the world. You know, so people, and, and that's how people will take you seriously and take you credibly. If you, mm. if you, if you, you know, if you shout, hey, everyone's got to go vegan, they've got to do it tomorrow. And um, I think you lose, whilst I, in many ways, I sympathize and empathize with the argument, I think you lose credibility because it's not going to happen. Um, and that's where, you know, you've got to be able to, you do have to get politicians on side, unfortunately, you know, and you do have to get big business on side mm. and you do have to get people on side. And, the great thing about living in a capitalist economy to a certain extent is that the consumer is king or queen yeah yeah no, um, sure. you know businesses will will respond to what people buy and what, yeah, yeah. you know you would argue businesses actually corral and, and motivate people to buy in a certain way but the other way around is if we can motivate consumers citizens consumers to buy meat-free products and to see the benefit in it and to think I'll give it a go, actually. Mm. That was part of my talk yesterday. Just give it a go. Mm. Have a go at one of the steaks. Have a go with the chicken pieces. Have a go. You know, you don't need to jump straight to tofu and say mm. time and go, oh, it's all a bit weird. I don't quite know what to do. Go and buy something that looks like a burger and try it in a bun. And I bet you'll love it. You know what? Well, yeah, because it is really nice. I mean, the, the Starbucks um, burger is insanely nice. It's nicer than a burger. It is Starbucks so good. Oh, okay. oh, uh, the yeah. McDonald's plant burgers are all right but they never seem to get the heat just right. It always seems mm -hmm. to be a bit cold. But the Starbucks burger, man, I, I, I swear it's me. I really do. It's so it, good. It, um, I, I've had the McPlant and I've had the Burger King. The Burger King's are good too, but there's yeah. that thing about how it's yeah. cooked. I mean, the Burger King one isn't technically vegan, technically yeah. vegan, because they, they can't cook it separately. Um, but I think, you know, the same as you, the, the wonderful thing is that it, you know, it has the taste and texture of me. I was at, um, as a society, as the vegetarian society, we display because because we 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 um, trademark lots and lots of products as mm. you know, approved for vegetarians, approved for vegans. And we were at the um, Institute of Food and Drink exhibition at the Excel, which is enormous. It's like a massive yeah. warehouse. But in one area, you had a load of exhibitors. There was you know, um, Beyond Meat, Future Farm vegetarian butcher they were all gathered around they were all giving out samples and i remember standing there thinking wow do you know six seven years ago this this didn't really exist yeah yeah, yeah. and now look at it's at a mainstream food event 
Um, it's not a vegetarian or vegan food event. There were lots of other meat producers in there, but there's a mm. whole section now. And they were giving out samples, and you could see people wanting, you know, you're just standing observing people going, that's really good. It's mm. really good. Mm. Um, and that's now. So yeah. imagine in five years' time or 10 years' time yeah. what it's going to be like. Imagine when the thing that I gets me really excited, I have to say, is the plant-based food side is great, but the, the, what they're calling cellular agriculture mm. now, which is the fact that you can, I know, you know I'm going to have an issue because, you know, cultivated meat in a lab, if, if they're going to produce it and there's no animals involved, you get the DNA from, it, from a database yeah. and you replicate meat, you know, um, I would say probably still a lot of the health research shows that vegetarians and vegans are healthier by not having meat in the diet. So I'll probably say, well, if you can start to produce dairy products, mm. which people are doing now, so if you can produce the whey proteins and the caseins in milk and create something which is effectively milk yeah. as it came from a cow, but produced in the factory from a DNA database, um, I think that could be a major game changer mm. because it'd be low carbon, um, you can produce it presumably in factories near to where you are, so the whole local bit and transport yeah. emissions would decline. Um, uh, most people who are vegetarians say they can't go vegan because they just stumble over cheese every mm. time. You know, you blast the cheese and all those dopamine receptors go off in the brain. Um, well, if you can start to create what would effectively be lab-based cheese and a variety of cheese, and there's Stilton's, Cheddar's, Breeze, what's, what's not to like? Mm. actually you know and in some ways that comes back to that conversation to say maybe as much as it is my job is to encourage people hey go vegetarian or vegan it's also trying to change the food landscape around people so mm. actually i'm not telling you not to eat cheese why would i work for vegetarian society well i'm saying why not try this plant-based cheese or even better why not try this cellular agriculture cheese they're going to have to find a name um <laughs> because the daily mail will it's call it frankenstein it. food it's sure. frankenstein food yeah, yeah. It's it's from a lab. Do don't touch it it's like mm, as opposed to where it comes should we go through the process of where it comes from at the moment yeah, yeah, probably, um yeah. uh but i do think you know the plant-based food revolution and the cell-based food revolution could could be a revolution in name you know mm. it, it, it i think it could be i i I'd love to be having this conversation again in 2030 mm. and saying, you know, let's look back, Scott, at the interview yeah, we did yeah. in 2022 and we were chatting about all this stuff. Well, it's now, hey, yeah. how has the world changed in that intervening eight years? Because if you go back eight years, there were no plant-based sections mm. in supermarkets like there are now. No. And the pace of change is, is not going to be linear. It's going to be exponential. You know? What do you think? Why, why is it just, it does feel like an overnight um, exponential change in offerings. What is what? What's happened? Is it is it been a technological revolution, or people have just started buying it more, so it then self perpetuates and businesses arrive because of it? Or I, I think there's probably two things. I think you know, um, veganuary has been phenomenally successful. Mm -hmm. I think it's implanted the idea that it's okay to have a go at mm -hmm. plant based foods because now oh, I'm doing veganuary, you know, rather than all trying vegan food. Mm -hmm. a bit weird. I'm mm -hmm. doing veganuary. Mm -hmm. my, my only criticism you know some people may well treat it a bit like a challenge but i did veganuary for 30 days like where's my burger i'm desperate for some meat mm -hmm. as opposed to being a lot but you know i think they've got great stats to do show a lot of people do stay with it we've got national vegetarian week yeah um i think there's a lot more it's a lot more it's normalized the idea of vegetarian and vegan eating it's it's still it's still niche and we've got to remember that a lot more people would identify as flexitarian Right. And they may not give themselves that badge, flexitarian, but they they would say, "Oh, yeah, I'm meat free a couple of days a week because so mm. I want to be healthy." Um, but I think alongside that, you mentioned technology. I think technology will, you know, if you think about the um, the way that you can produce plant based foods now, and the way that, you know, as I said, I mentioned for the cellular agriculture, the way that people are now looking at how you can create dairy and meat in the lab. Um, I think those that perfect storm of people being more interested in it means investors pour money into it which means yeah. the technology yeah, can develop and grow and anyway. round around and becomes a yeah. positive feedback loop and the whole thing starts to grow more people involved more investors go in the business creates more people come in and, and up it goes and i would hope that as i say you know um let's make a date <laughs> let's make a date and say you know on the eight on the 19th of may 
2030, you and I are going to right. repeat this interview right. and um, let's have a, <laughs> he's writing it in his diary. <laughs> All right. And let's have a, let's, let's take some snippet highlights of what we've talked about here about, you know, um, the number of vegetarians and vegans in the country, the amount of products, the, uh, what supermarkets look like, the number of people who've given up meat. What farms look like. Just see farms. how it, yeah. See? And what for livestock farms look like? What, they're and what gonna, and, uh, they diversify? You know, how are things changing? You know, and I'm always at pains to say there's a danger that we, I can come across, or the vegetarian society, or whoever can come across as anti-farming, and absolutely not anti-farming. Yeah. Well, you've but, you know, um, there's a huge number of farmers who are arable farmers for start. Well, yeah, so exactly. Be anti exactly. Farming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I suppose, do you think many farms that are livestock are because they can't be arable? It's a choice based on the land that they're on. Something I'm really interested in researching um, because there's a lot of work. There's been sorry, there's been some work going and looking at actually what could you do with some of those upland pasture lands that people said mm. you, you can't do anything with them. They're actually they're actually it's actually some people say it's actually better to put sheep on them because yeah. it's because at least you're using the land productively. Mm. Um, there is a counter argument to say yeah, but if you were to rewild that land because the yeah. Lake District should not be bare. I use the Lake District because I'm you know, not too far away from it, but you stood only the Lake District. These should not be bare hills. They should mm. be huge wooded areas right. apart from the very tops above the tree line. We forget that. It's, it's mm. only the sheep. <laughs> it's yeah, only yeah. us having cleared it and then the sheep nibbling at the grass that keeps it looking um, looking the way it is. There is some work going on at looking at some of the new protein crops. Um, uh, you know, Even looking at things mm. like hemp. You know, right. Can you actually... Is it true that there is some land which is simply not suitable for anything? Or is it that you could convert some of that land to growing certain types of crops mm. which could be used for uh, human consumption? Or clothing, mm. you know? Um, mm. some, of, some of the alternative um, clothing materials that we, we need to look at now. Um, and I do think one of the areas I'm really interested in the vegetarian society is, is looking at how we can commission research which starts to lead us to your point earlier that solution for farmers mm. so it's not just well you can just go rewild can't you mm. so Fine. well how do we do that what where's the plan it's like oh, well, I don't know just rewild you just let it you just leave it don't you? or throw some seed around um no actually here's some commissioned research here's a very detailed map of landscape throughout the UK Here's the land types. Here's the current use. Here's what it could be doing. Here's the economic return you get for it. Here's what the government subsidies would need to be to drive that. Mm. Um, and you can start to say, well, okay, so if you take stock off the land and you decide, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll have some managed rewilding and we'll have some alternative protein crops that you can grow over here. So that's like, well, those, you know, and the government will pay you to rewild that land because it's a public good. Yeah. They may want to open up access onto land. Because if it's a public good, there needs to be public benefit, and the public needs to be able to access it. Um, but you'll be you'll be paid to grow different crops and, mm. and paid as an environmental land manager. You know, mm. farmers are always at pains to say that they are stewards and guardians of the environment. So yeah, yeah, that's great. I'm I'm, I'm going to pay you to do that. You know, you know. I would have, I would imagine that if if we and like you say, it's not overnight, but there's going to be a, a huge demand for plant based products. Um, which will farmers will have to um, uh, satisfy. So I don't know whether all of the arable farmers in all of the you know in every corner of the world can then take pick up that strain and feed everyone when there is a lack of meat or not. And if the if they can't, then it would be the livestock uh, farmers that would hopefully pick up the, the slack on that. I would have thought. Yeah, um, it, it's, I, I think. Um, you know, a, a lot of African cooking, I think, is, is very traditional plant-based cooking. You know, it, meat is there, but it's not it's not like a Western diet where it's mm. meat three times a day. Um, you know, the basis of it is 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 plant-based food. There was a really interesting podcast that I listened to that talked about, you know, in, in the in the in the States, there's a big movement around soul food and comfort food. It's very much yeah. through the South. And there was a counterpoint saying uh, it's the food of slavery. You know, it's right. it's the foods that were eaten was you know the slave master at the time would be throwing these scraps to slaves, and it created yeah what is a hugely comforting food out of it. But of course, mm. it does lead to high rates of obesity and all sorts of other problems. And actually, the very traditional African diet was was not a plant based diet in its entirety, but a much greater yeah. proportion of rich plant based foods. And so 
Um, you do have to be extremely sensitive, I think, as, as, as somebody who is white in a developed country telling the rest of the country oh, how they sure. can live their lives. I mean, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That, that I'd be the last person to go there. But I think we have... Ned did mention that at one point because he was saying that um, they were saying, well, what about what about um, other countries where they can't farm and their, their diet is dependent on me? And he was saying, fine, you know, they we're not saying everyone should do this. We're just saying the ones that can change should. And the ones that Absolutely. can't, that's fine. It, it, don't, because the that's difference fine. would be so massive anyway, it wouldn't really matter. No, exactly. And I would all, I would maybe even go a bit further and say, you know, you maybe you look at that as a managed transition that, mm. you know, so maybe fine for now. But actually what we'll do is we're not going to take meat farming away from you, but we're going to surround you with the opportunities mm. to actually eat other foods. Because the reality is, you know, there's more than enough food in the world to go around. It's global geopolitics that prevents mm. it happening. Um, you know, we consume too much and we throw away too much. And, and, and yet, you know, a lot of countries, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, don't have enough to eat. I mean, it's incredibly imbalanced. Anyway. That's where I would probably go a little bit further and say, let's, let's, let's not assume that they, they always have to be outside of a solution. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's give them that voice in the argument, because that's one of the big criticisms of the climate debates, COP26, that still are dominated by you know, the G8, the G20 and, and, and you know, the collective of organisations who are having all the problems of climate change, but none of the benefits that we've had for the previous mm. 200 years mm. are the ones whose voice is heard least. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think you can apply that to the food system. You know, we've got to be very careful that, that all voices have an equal yeah. an equal way and also you know step back and realize actually you know we're the ones causing the problem here mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so you know let's listen to the people who's who's who are affected by some of the changes we're looking to create and um the, where i would probably disagree with what you were saying with everything yet is say rather than leave them outside so well, okay you can carry on doing that i'd actually bring them and say well you know we would like you to be part of the solution let's look at what yeah. how we could do it in a way that you know means that you can have a rich tasty nutritious healthy occasionally indulgent diet yeah, yeah for sure. um, just like everybody else the talk i gave yesterday i i, I had the five the, why veggie vegan why reduce your meat in five slides right you know, and one was animal ethics you know the way we compartmentalize animals so everyone wants to protect our native wildlife you know one loves hedgehogs everyone loves companion animals pets so we'll be tired if you mistreat a dog or a cat but you know, pigs, cows, sheep, pigs as intelligent as dogs, if not more so, yet we just happily bundle them into trucks and slaughter them. So how do we overcome that that distinction and that 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 mindset that we've developed about the way we see and view and treat different animals? One is climate, you know, meat by foot by kilogram is, has the highest carbon emissions compared to plant-based foods. Um, one is biodiversity. We use far too much land for animal agriculture. We could reduce that land, we could rewild, we could have a rich, flourishing world, and we could all eat really well. Uh, one is health, you know, two yeah. huge long studies, uh, one called um, Epic Oxford, one with actually Seventh-day Adventists okay. <laughs> in religion, mainly in the States, but a much higher proportion of them are vegetarian because it's about 40%. And uh, longitudinal clinical studies of both groups have shown that the people who are vegetarian or vegan are actually healthier over time, heart disease, blood pressure, cancers. And the other one is budget. We're living at a time when, you know, inflation's at 9%. Um, actually, there was a study from Oxford University that showed that whole food, vegetarian, and vegan diets are much cheaper. I mean, you sort of instinctively know that anyway. Yeah. But if you eat a whole food, vegan diet, a whole food, vegetarian diet, it's it's much better on the budget than a meat-based diet. So five reasons. Yeah. Very, very simple. What's not to like? If you could win an argument on logical facts alone, the world would be in a much better place. Mm. The reality is you can have all the logical facts in the world. If someone doesn't want to hear them. Yeah. Um, or they're you're using language that they don't understand, or you're talking down to them, or you look different to them. Um, if you're one of the metropolitan elites who, you know, all this sort of tropes and, and clear, you can be as logical as you want and your argument can be as robust as you want and you'll still lose and you won't get through. And that's going to be the clever bit in terms of meeting people where they're at empathizing with them having a conversation with them and bringing them along and changing the landscape around them not in a bad way mm. but in a way that allows them to eat 
kind of what they're familiar with, but just yeah. produced in a different way. Um, and there's not enough of that. You know, there's a place for shouting and there's a place for protests and banners, but there's also a place for that, you know, the the, the hard yards, I always call well, it, think... where, you, you know, you've got to just get people over the line and it's conversations and talking and bringing people along with you. I think you can, it's it's excusable to be passionate about it and angry about it to a certain degree, because I think once once the penny really drops and you see people eating what you now see differently for whatever reason as being flesh of another animal, um, it does and and the and all of the you know the list of, of negative things that are attributed to that as well, it's very difficult not to get passionate and, and finger wavy, especially when you've just made that slip move across from eating meat to not eating meat and i've certainly felt it um and you know ask anybody I, who i work with or i live with you know if i don't mention something to do with vegetarian food at least once a day they'd be mega surprised because it's, it's kind of consumed yeah, my absolutely. thoughts because i just and that's think, brilliant yeah but but it but it, it's also really tedious for everybody, <laughs> everybody <else. laughs> and I, I am very aware of that um but i i I think it's um, it's still a challenge I'm up for, and I'm I'm really pleased that you and I can go in this together. And I, I really, really hope and pray that we can be sat with peers talking about you know a, a Greg's vegan sausage roll and all that kind of stuff. Because I, this despite him, I don't. I he's a human being, and I think you can talk to him. I think what he has real issue with is the the finger waving vegan. And 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 that's not what I am, and it's not what you are. No, um, no. And I think if we can pull that off, then I think it, all the because there are, I think there's a huge amount of people on the fence deciding what to do and thinking about it, but not oh, I'll do it next, whatever. Um, I, I, I think you're right. I think you know it's it's a bit like Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point. You know, you need to find that tipping point mm -hmm. at which uh, it suddenly becomes normal mm -hmm. to eat. Non, well, to, I, to I mean, there's meat. lots of things that have happened in the past that have demonstrated that you can do massive transitional changes and it becomes the norm. I mean, um, I've got an electric car, let's say, and, and I've seen lots of people now making silent passes and you're thinking, this is really surreal. You know, if my granddad saw this, it would blow his freaking mind, you know. Um, but then you have people going, yeah, but what about the batteries in the cars? I mean, there always seems to be a counter argument for trying to do something good. Well, there's something I saw on social media today, um, which was being pushed around. And it's, it is exactly that. It's that, you know, before, before somebody invented the internal combustion engine, they were walking and riding horses everywhere. Before Thomas Edison invented yeah. the electric light bulb, they were, they were making it with, you know, oil lamps. Yeah. And before climate activists and people create a better world, they are going to have to drive diesel cars and petrol cars and fly. Yeah. And just because they do it doesn't mean they're bad. It means, mm -hmm. you know, they are living in the world they live in, but yeah. working towards a better one. There's so many different ways to create change. There will be the long bringing hearts and minds with you. The one I always use is, a, you know, the, the smoking ban in pubs. Yeah. Who'd have thought yeah, at some never, point in the 80s and really 90s that actually. you could ban smoking in pubs and people would just put up with it? Um, and I yet, think that people talking into me, it'll seem as absurd as somebody's lighting up in a, in a bar. It will. I, the, the other one, you know, I campaigned um, with a number of others actively for the, the, the charge on carrier bags. Mm. You know, yeah. we were told by various outlets, oh, there will be chaos, there'll be riots at the checkouts <laughs> if people can't have their bags. And literally, I'd say within 24 hours, carrier bag use had declined by 90% it's, within it. Yeah. Not because you banned it, but because you put a charge on it. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, we talked about taxation, the role of taxation earlier, and, you know, taxing bad stuff. Like really good example. And, and, and people, I, you know, the great British public, hey, we all like a moan over our beer mm. in the pub, don't we? But the reality is we're pretty robust people, mm. I think, and we're pretty stoic. And if something mm. changes, we might grumble about it, but boy, do we get on with it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I think sometimes we don't give people enough credit for the way you, what seems like a seismic change, will just people will adapt very very quickly and so well, hopefully you you're right hopefully in in a in in when did you say the 19th of, of may which year did you go for uh, i went for 2030 because 2030. It's, it's i reckon it's going to be sooner than that i think i think i think there's going to be i mean I, th I think 
I don't think everybody will not be eating meat by then, but I think it, the, the, the shift will be gigantic by then, for sure. I, I, um, I know it will yeah. be, and I, I think that's, you know, the reason I say 2030 is because people, and I've been guilty of it, everyone's talking about this is the decade of change. We've had decades mm. of yapping and mm. talking and conferences and the reality, and this is from a climate perspective, really, but you biodiversity on there as well. We are running out of road. You know, you think that, you know, um, Kyoto in 98, Rio in 1992, mm. there was so many, you know, global warming was still really a theory when I was at uni in the 80s. Um, and now we're saying, oh, you know, one and a half is now at risk. Maybe actually we're looking at three degrees of warming. Mm. Um, and the reality is, in terms of cutting carbon, you need to cut, although people say go carbon neutral um, by... 2050 most of that cutting has to be done quickly yeah you know you have to cut quickly by 2030 um and so i think you're right i think if we're going to get this right i mean i and i see more electric cars on the road now than i've ever mm. seen the little green stripe down the number mm. plate i see that quite a lot now, far more and that's government saying we're going to ban new new diesel and petrol cars by you know, 20 30 35 whatever it is so and that's why when i started off talking about politicians it's so important yeah, yeah, they're yeah. the ones who'll put five p on a carry bag charge. They're the ones who'll ban smoking. They're the ones who'll signal mm. that the industry's got to change by twenty thirty five, mm. and business and people start to revolve around it. Mm. So, as much as the grassroots on the ground activism is really important, it's it, being in those political things and getting policy and legislation over the line and winning arguments there and being with Piers Morgan and making it normal is mm. also just as, if not more, important. I'd say. Well, let's hope we see him, eh?